Now, this is now a beautiful deterministic picture. A coin toss then is going to give you something which is completely predictable. Where is there any room for randomness? Why do we imagine that a coin toss gives us heads half the time and tails half the time? If, for example, we have a high velocity and a very small angular velocity, then we will be in the red region beneath the first of your hyperbolic curves, and therefore the coin will give you a head. Well, because if you have a very high velocity but the coin is barely spinning, well, it will come back and it will not have spun very much, and therefore you'll get a head. If, likewise, you toss the coin very slowly, so it doesn't go very far, but you toss it with a high angular velocity, well, the coin will not have much time to spin before it's caught again, and therefore you will still get a head. If you increase speed and velocity in concert, in such a way that you land in the next band, you'll get a tail. This seems like there's no room here for anything but determinism. Well, let's pause and consider, in a real experiment, where are we in this figure? Remember, your x-axis here is your velocity v. Your y-axis here represents the angular velocity omega. Now, measurements of actual coin tosses, when people toss coins like this, will show that the velocity imparted is somewhere typically between 7 to 9 feet per second. Now, in terms of scientific units, in terms of metric units, that's about 2 to 3 meters per second. And so, in your figure, this corresponds to that narrow band of velocities from 2 to 3 meters per second. What about your angular velocity? Yeah, one can imagine how to measure velocity, right? For instance, we just toss the coin, catch it, and we can figure out what the velocity should have been. The angular velocity appears to be a trickier thing to, to measure. Of course, one can imagine you know, one has access to sophisticated equipment. One could use a laser beam, bounce it off the coin, and measure various parameters. But one doesn't have to get nearly so sophisticated. Right? Percy Daikon is at Stanford, came up with a very clever, ingenious idea for measuring velocity and angular velocity using dental floss and watching it unravel. And via such experiments, he concluded that a typical coin toss has an angular velocity of around 36 to 39 revolutions per second. If you translate that into radians, that corresponds to somewhere around 225 to 250 radians per second. And you realize that our picture is woefully inadequate because on the one hand, we have speeds much larger than are actually realized. On the other, in terms of the angular velocities, we are nowhere near where we need to be. And I've shown you angular velocity is up to about 14 radians per second. And what we really need is something like 225 to 250 radians per second. So let's go ahead and redraw this picture by foreshortening the velocity axis to the region of velocities of interest, say up to about 5 meters per second, and stretching out the angular velocity axis to the region again of interest of around 250 to 300 radians per second. And if we did that, we get a slightly more congested family of curves, all hyperbolic, of course, which look like this. Now notice, velocities are running up to 5 meters per second, angular velocity is up to 300 radians per second, and the region of interest to us, the region where typical coin tosses reside, are velocities between 2 and 3 meters per second, and angular velocities between 225 and 250 radians per second, as shown in that narrow band in your figure on the right. So naturally enough, we should look at that small region and expand it, and look at it carefully to see what stories it can unfold for us. So let's take a look at that little shaded region. Velocities between 2 to 3 meters per second, angular velocities between 225 and 250 radians per second. And now you notice the hyperbolic segments which are captured in this little window, 
appear almost vertical. They appear to striate this window in narrow bands. The shaded regions represent combinations of velocity and angular velocity for which the outcome will be a head. And the unshaded regions correspond to combinations of velocity and angular velocity for which the outcome will be a tail. And this is what the picture looks like. Now, you will tell me justly, well, again, there doesn't appear to be any room for randomness. You tell me what the speed and the angular velocity is, and I know exactly what happens. So, for example, if here is a combination of V and omega, it lands you slap, bang, in the middle of a shaded region, you say, well, the outcome is going to be ahead. But here is a rub. It is very hard, in practice, to attain exactly the same speed and the same angular rotation each time one tosses the coin. There is naturally some variability, some uncertainty in these parameters. And so a natural question is, how does an uncertainty in the initial velocity and in the initial angular velocity affect the outcome of the toss? So if instead of the particular velocity and angular velocity, in your picture, it's about slightly around 2.2 meters per second in terms of velocity, and maybe about, oh, around 237 radians per second in angular velocity. Now, suppose there's some uncertainty in the angular velocity, the rate at which the coin is turning. Now, see what happens. So, if there's uncertainty there, then you're up and down in a certain region, but you never leave a band. The bands are almost vertical here. And so vertical uncertainties don't seem to matter very much. What if there is uncertainty translationally in your velocity? Oh, but now the bands are very narrow. And so even a small uncertainty leaves a shaded band, goes into an unshaded band, then there perhaps goes back into a shaded band. Small uncertainties result in dramatic changes in the outcome of the coin toss. And let's summarize. So, the outcome of the coin toss is, for the kinds of velocities and angular velocities encountered in practice, relatively insensitive to small changes in angular velocity, but it is very sensitive to small changes in the translational velocity. The shaded region and the unshaded region are almost equal in area. Any reasonable model of uncertainty will then tell you that you're as likely to end up in a shaded region as in an unshaded region. You conclude inevitably that the coin toss outcome is heads and tails with equal chance. Remarkably, chance arises and it is relatively insensitive to the particular model of uncertainty for your velocity a purely deterministic physical experiment governed by Newtonian laws of mechanics can be ascribed a chance-driven outcome because small uncertainties, regardless of their origin, manifest themselves into this fair chance that is observed at the end.